The talk is put together by Mustafa Jamgoz, who's Professor of Cancer Biology at Imperial College, and me, and I'm Professor of Environmental uh, Chemistry, Geochemistry at Imperial College. For example, until recently, I chaired the government's advisory committee on hazardous substances. So why do I think I know anything about cancer? 26 years ago this year, I was in Canada um, doing all sorts of things at an international conference when I discovered a lump in my left breast. Being British, I stayed and did all the things I was supposed to do, like chairing sessions, giving keynotes, but came back to the UK and had a left radical mastectomy. There was a single tumour. It hadn't spread to the lymph nodes. Just go away, forget it, and enjoy my life. Well, being me, I couldn't do that, so I was fishing around for things I could do to help myself. And I came across uh, Brian Ford's Bristol diet. And basically, it was changing to lots of fruit and veg and pulses and seeds, which I did. But it was also changed from meat and have yogurt, which I did. And I was quite evangelical about that diet. But after about five years, I noticed I had a lump under my arm. And I used the sort of calipers used to measure fossils to prove to my oncologist it was growing. So reluctantly, they took it out. And sure enough, it was cancer. They checked me thoroughly, but within six weeks, another cancer had come back in the scar. Uh, they took that out. They gave me um, chest irradiation, 25 treatments. Within six weeks, I did that, and the cancer was back again in a lymph node. They took that out. They irradiated my ovaries to remove estrogen. And within two weeks, this huge lump had grown in my neck. Um, it was like a sort of boiled egg sticking out of my neck. And I started chemo, but it wasn't doing very much. And at one point I was told, you have two months to live if we are lucky. OK, I pushed the doctor to tell me what was happening, and that's what I was told. Well, at that point I had some incredible luck. I've worked a lot in China in the past, and the Chinese heard of my predicament and sent me this box of things that were herbal suppositories that looked like firework rockets. Mm -hmm. And I said to my husband, no wonder women in China don't get breast cancer. And then I said, why don't they get breast cancer? Because he'd worked there separately from me. And he thought about it and he said, they don't have a dairy industry. Remember, they don't eat dairy. When they go in the field with us, they take powdered milk. So at that point, I gave up the two organic low-fat yogurts I was eating every day. And to everybody's amazement, this lump started to itch and shrink, and within six weeks, it had gone completely. And I was totally cancer-free for 18 years, and then my husband kept saying, Jane, there's a funny lump growing on your chest. And by the time I went to my oncologist, it was 80 square centimetres. And what had I done? I'd become very lax. I'd been eating falafel in the Imperial college canteen, not realising contained powdered dairy. All the odd egg sandwich with butter isn't going to hurt me. And so I had become incredibly lax because I was obsessed with a book I was writing called Pollutant Human Health and the Environment. Anyway, I went back to my old oncologist. I said, I know I'm going to have to have heroic chemotherapy. He said, no, 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 we'll just put you on letrozole. So I'm on this tiny dose. I think it's two milligrams a day of letrozole. And I went on my strict diet, my plant program, one diet, and within three weeks, this 80 square centimetre lump was down to 36 square centimetre lump. And within a, a, about three months, it had gone totally. So um, I believe very much that diet is one of the main factors in, um, in cancer. Now, the talk I'm going to give is based on a new book that will be published in May, um, which I've put Professor Jamgoz as first author because people can say about me, oh, she's just a scientist. She's just an engineer. What would she know about the science of cancer? But with Mustafa's name on it, he's a world-famous cancer biologist. I don't think people will say that, and I hope it will throw a hand grenade into the bunker of the cancer establishment and make them rethink and think about some of the things we've heard about today. We keep hearing about the success of breast cancer treatment, but all the time breast cancer incidence is going up. And as somebody who's had breast cancer, I can assure you, it does change your life. You are more likely to be anxious. You are more likely to be depressed. And the same with prostate cancer. So I don't really see this as success. I want far more effort on prevention. 
Now, <clears throat> cancers can be divided into cancers of poverty, usually linked to things like viruses or, um, in the case of liver cancer, stomach cancer and cervical <coughs> cancer, for example, or other pathogens. But there's a whole other group of cancers called cancers of affluence, which very much affect the developed rich world. And this is the um, age standardised incident rate, 100,000 from the uh, W. HO, IARC website, and you can see very clearly that prostate cancer is a Western cancer, even South Africa. I mean, if you look on the Telegraph blog, you will see that I predicted that when um, Al Magahi was taken from Scotland back to Libya, he would live a lot longer than anybody was predicting, because Scotland has one of the highest rates, Libya one of the lowest rates. And if you go back to the time when reliable cancer registries were first taken, you can see that all the Oriental countries have had really low death rates, despite having appalling hospitals, etc., whereas all the um, Occidental countries have had high rates. And you don't need to be a statistician to see there's a difference. And I think the big difference is the diet. I've lived in China, I've lived in Thailand, lived in Japan, and I know their diet is fundamentally different to the standard American diet, which is now called the SAD, standard American diet, SAD. <laughs> and this is what's happening in those countries as they switch to the SAD diet. Look at South Korea. In 12 years, the incidence of breast cancer has gone up 67.9%. And all those countries that were very low, they're switching to our diet, and their rates are going through the roof. Now, last time I was in Korea, and I've worked with the Koreans a lot, I arrived in time for dinner, and I was offered cream of mushroom soup, which I declined. I was offered a steak that was an American style, ready to get up and walk away off my plate with chips. And I was offered um, gato, you know, oh, black forest gato with cream and ice cream, and I declined it. And they said, are you ill? I said, no, I just don't eat that sort of food. Oh, would you like some Korean food? I'd love some. And so they bought Korean food, and they said they thought I'd always just been polite about their food, but I actually loved it. You can see countries that had a high rate haven't shifted so much. They've already been on a rotten diet. <laughs> anyway, let's, let me tell you what our 10 steps are. First of all, understanding what cancer is, taking away this scary image of this awful alien thing that's got us, understanding the healing hierarchy. Lots of people who've spoken earlier have referred to this. Orthodox treatments, and I firmly believe that people should have orthodox treatments. Let me be clear on that. Complementary therapies with an evidence base, diet, my 10 food factors, exercise we've heard a lot about, and I completely endorse it, Avoiding harmful substances, very important. And stress reduction, I think spiritual health is important. And what we also cover in this book is the politics of cancer. You know, why are we not told the truth about the things that are really, really linked to cancer and how we can prevent it? So first of all, we have this awful image of cancer. Because when Hippocrates first saw untreated cancer, it's likely he saw the distended blood vessels created by angiogenesis. That's the way cancers attract blood vessels to them. And he thought this looks like a crab. And he thought the idea was some alien organism had got the person. And if you look at the um, traditional view of cancer, this is from Weinberg, the man who discovered the BRCA gene. It sounds as if it cannot be beaten. So you get deregulated energy. It avoids immune surveillance. So Catherine showed beautifully it didn't. Sustained proliferation. It keeps growing when it shouldn't. Resisting cell death. Avoiding growth suppression. Invasion and metastasis. Angiogenesis. So it really sounds grim. And that's the traditional view of cancer. And I'm going to tell you, there's a lot coming out now which says this is not the case. There's a lot you can do. So primary breast cancer isn't too much of a problem. Old ladies used to die of it. If it just sits there doing nothing, no problem. The problem arises when you get metastatic disease. This is the, type, this is the stage of cancer that kills most people. Um, one, the, the, on your right side, you can see local um, 
local spread. And on the left side, you can see spread to the lungs and liver and various other organs. And that's the stage that kills most people. That's the stage you really want to prevent. We've heard a lot about cancer being mainly a genetic disease, particularly in relation to BRCA1 and BRCA2. But no, it isn't. We now know, and Catherine mentioned this earlier, that 98% of cancers are epigenetic. Well, what does that mean? Well, these three creatures have identical, identical DNA sequences. So a caterpillar, a putiper, and a butterfly, they have the same genes. But what's happened is different gene expression. So I want you to imagine a string of coloured lights, and one bad light will cause cancer. That was the old idea. We now know that isn't the case. All that so-called junk DNA regulates gene expression. So you can switch a gene on, you can upregulate it. You can downregulate it, you can switch it off, or you can slap a lump of protein over it to silence it completely. And that is why we now understand that cancer is an epigenetic disease, and it brings all sorts of possibilities, why lifestyle, diet, everything like that helps so much. And effectively, in one way, you can think of cancer as, as the butterfly that's flipped back to being a caterpillar. Because what has happened is cancer cells have flipped back to being like our embryonic stem cells or having a lot of those characteristics. They're our own embryonic stem cell-like cancer cells, which is why it's so hard to treat. So... Um, Cancer is our own cells behaving badly because they've been damaged. It's our own cells that have changed their genetics partly by mutation. They have embryonic stem cell-like characteristics, so they shouldn't be in an adult body. Epigenetics is the abnormal expression of otherwise normal genes. The whole thing is the interaction of our genome with diet, lifestyle, and environment. Now, several of you have mentioned Dean Ornish's amazing study but the thing was, he then went on to look at what had happened to the genetics of the cancer. And what he showed was that the men who had gone for the exercise, stress management and diet, he did this work with Craig Venter, the first person to sequence the human genome, and he found that after only three months, 48 protective genes had been turned on and 453 cancer genes, oncogenes, had been turned off. I mean, that is so amazing. And there are lots of other studies now showing the same thing, particularly one in cervical cancer I read recently. Now, we've heard a lot about this, and um, so I won't labour it too much. But I think very much I believe in orthodox medicine. The evidence is mostly from reductionist science. I think complementary therapies, there's increasingly an evidence base, including functional brain scans, which David Serpent Shriver did a lot of work towards. Lifestyle improvements, very important, but also this personal development that several other speakers like Dorothy and Catherine have alluded to. And what are we trying to do with all this? Well, what we're trying to do is restore our balance, which is known to doctors as homeostasis, because the brainstem, our brainstem, runs our autonomic nervous system, and you can't access it directly. And if you're too into fight or flight mode, then you can see that the body quickly rewires itself to that sort of panic to make you run away, which is fine if you're a primitive man running from an angry bear, but with chronic stress, if you stay in that state for too long, it will make you ill. So the whole idea, and the Chinese have been onto this for 5,000 years, of balancing yin and yang, we now realise in Western speak, one is talking about the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and digest system. The other is the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight or flight mode. And so in the 20th, 21st century, we're often in the state of chronic fight or flight, and that is very bad for our health, and some of the methods that earlier speakers mentioned are very important in trying to deal with this. I won't talk to anything about conventional treatments except to say um, I've always had them. <clears throat> now, there are lots of complementary therapies that we could find no evidence, there was a sound evidence base, 
They're usually done in expensive clinics and um, there is very little evidence base for them. And uh, for example, um, this um, being put under high hyperbaric oxygen, it simply doesn't work because cancers have got such a chaotic blood supply that you can't get the oxygen in. And here's a scan showing that in the case of thigh muscle on the top, you can get the oxygen in, but in the uh, tumour below, you can't get the oxygen in. And there's a lot of stuff in the peer-reviewed literature making that point. The other thing I want to mention is that when a cancer cell is about to metastasize, it becomes very electrically excitable. So Mustafa does work which shows that you can suddenly see the electrical excitability of the cancer cell shift. You can see how it's jumped up. So it's gone from a normal low position, it's suddenly jumped up. That tells you it's very electrically excitable and it can metastasize. So just as you can get a heart ECG, you can get a cancer ECG. <coughs> and one of the reasons for this is that the... So you remember the epigenetics and flipping back to being a, ca a caterpillar? One of the problems is that in cancers, the channel that controls sodium coming in and out of the cell has flipped back to being embryonic. So cancer cells love mopping up sodium, and then they use it to become electrically excitable. And you can see the locally advanced breast cancer, how much it likes sodium. So one of my pieces of advice is don't add salt to your diet, don't have monosodium glutamate, don't have sodium sulfates, and don't have bicarbonate of soda. The other thing that's very interesting, another um, channel in the cell that flips back to being embryonic is the one that controls oxygen within the cancer cells. So cancer cells are very hypoxic. And as I've shown, you can't get oxygen in, so that doesn't help. But there is something that you can do, because, because the cancer cell would die if it didn't keep flinging out hydrogen ions, all cancers have got this red ring around them, which is an area of very high acidity, because it helps the cancer activate the enzymes it needs to digest the surrounding tissue and to metastasize. And that can be a target with your diet, as I'll show you. So the consequence of that acidity is digestion of tissue around it, so it helps cancer to invade and metastasize. Now again, we heard this morning from that wonderful doctor, Dr. Thomas, about seed and soil. And this is a concept that's becoming very adopted by many scientists. So you ha have a normal cell, you get DNA damage from all sorts of things, viruses, radiation, bad food, whatever, or chemicals in the environment, and you get an initiated cancer cell. Now, as we heard, as we saw from Catherine, as we saw from Dr. Thomas, the body mostly kills that off. But if you have a diet that's really high in hormones and growth factors, growth factors for most cancers, hormones for breast and prostate cancer, then the body will select for those damaged cells because they cannot handle growth factors and they cannot handle hormones. So, and then you go on to get um, spread under the uh, action of a special growth factor called VEGF, and things like Avastin are designed to block that. But again, it's dietary. Again, um, just reminding you that um, diet, the different diets of these people, um, it probably explains these different trends because, as in the case of breast cancer, when people from the low group move to the high group and change their diet, they rapidly get the same rates. So where do these things come from? My own experience and now the Harvard University website, I think it's 26th of January last year, they took issue with the healthy food plate of the American government and said milk products um, to prostate and ovarian cancer. I can't remember the others. Milk now contains 60 to 80 percent of our ingested female sex steroids, the remaining 20 percent from other animal products. Milk contains over 35 different hormones and 11 growth factors. Um, these are all from the peer reviewed literature. So I'm really keen that people do not have dairy. Um, my mum always used to say, But I had dairy all my life. Yes, mum, but you didn't have dairy as it's produced now. Cows used to produce 
about 12 pints of milk a day. They're now getting on for 50 pints of milk a day. We didn't milk cows when we were pregnant, when they were pregnant, sorry. And we didn't know how to do that, but in 1944, we learned how to do it. So here are some scientific reasons why we think diet helps. Cancer is not our alien, it's our own cells. They flip back to being um, primitive. They become electrically excitable and hy hyperactive. Anna's was mentioned this morning, and I think Catherine mentioned it. Many nutraceuticals, such as capsaicin in chili, resveratrol in red grapes, curcumin in turkey, in, in, in turmeric, these all suppress cellular excitability. They block those sodium channels, so the cancer can't metastasize nearly so easily. Cancer thrives in an acid environment, and the Western diet, which is high in cheese and yogurt and meat and all that stuff, is very acid generating. But you can use your diet to alkalize the body, it comes down to herbs and spices and fruit and veg. Our diet also affects the amount of growth factors and hormones which fuel cancer in our body. Um, so the 10 food factors are, and I think Catherine mentioned this again, social eating, eat organic as much as possible, pH balance of the diet, good proteins, bad proteins, good fats, bad fats, and uh, bad and good carbohydrates, animal or vegetable, vitamins, minerals, and supplements, and I agree with Dr. Thomas on everything he said, sugar and sweeteners, and healthy drinks. Now, a lot of doctors say that this idea that you can alkalize your body is nonsense. But it isn't nonsense. There's a lot of work being done in the Institute of Clinical Nutrition in Dortmund in Germany. I happen to know these two professors. Their paper is very erudite. I've just made it very simple and written it this way. The full chart with all the actual values is in, um, in, is in my book. But these are professors of biochemistry, and what they did was take the World Food Library, work out which foods had acids and alkalis in them, and then they did experiments on rats, and they did experiments on humans. So this is the best available information I know of um, which foods generate alkalis in your body and which are acid. And what's the worst food of all? Cheese. So there's a lot of hooey about carbohydrates, and I think it's really very simple. Um, the bad carbs are the white refined ones. Yudkin said in the 1950s, the famous uh, Cambridge physiologist, white sugar was pure, white and deadly. I agree completely, but I do still have molasses, raw cane sugar. I've worked in Jamaica, people go around eating it. I think it's absolutely fine. So as long as people have unrefined whole grain, brown rice, whatever, I think that's all fine. But the really good carbs, fruit and veg, they really are absolutely packed with anti-cancer substances, as are herbs and spices. We've heard a lot about exercise from other speakers. I completely agree with it, both for people's mental well-being and their physical well-being. And exercise, especially in green space or by the blue gym, which means by water, have been shown to be particularly effective. And in the book with Mustafa, we give lots of ideas on uh, ways of getting exercise. I think work is a powerful aid to recovery. Um, I find it's, if I get anxious, it, my best drug is to go and do some work, do some writing. Now, this is my speciality. Uh, we heard a lot about harmful substances. The ones I'm particularly concerned about are the ones that mess around with our hormones. The person who put this together, because I, I was working in these sort of areas, and in Rachel Carson, in her book in the 1960s, Silent Spring, described the thinning of eggshells in top of the food chain birds, like eagles and things. Then I actually worked on the problem where all around our coast, gastropods such as um, dog whelks and um, oysters were being wiped out. So the normal little animals at the top changed into those squiggly, funny, uh, orangey-coloured ones at the bottom because all the female oysters' egg tubes had become blocked because they were affected by a chemical called organotin. 
Hermaphrodism in frogs uh, caused by a very common um, herbicide called atrazine, used particularly on corn crops in the States. And in this country, we kept getting stories about fish feminization. You can see there the normal testes of the, of the fish with the little black um, uh, sperm in it. But you can also see these big, fat female eggs. And 100% of our fish in southeast England near sewage works are affected. And it wasn't until 1993 that Theo Colborne, the very distinguished biologist from Florida, came up with the term endocrine disruption. And since then, this research has taken off. Because what she's, I've, I've talked to Theo on the phone and said, what made you think of it? She said, well, she was asked to look into why there was so much peculiar behavior, same-sex nesting and mating, and also deformities and these sort of effects in wildlife, in birds and fish and frogs and you name it. She said the only thing she could come up with, she looked at viruses, radiation, electromagnetic radiation. She couldn't find any common factors. The only thing was... These creatures all contain chemicals like plasticizers, like pharmaceuticals, uh, female contraceptive pills. All these chemicals were causing this hormone disruption. So one of the things that's very important is to try to help people avoid that. And here are some of the sources. Pesticides uh, contain, frequently contain harmful substances, kind of disrupting. Preservatives in cosmetics, and a big no-no is perfumes. I, anybody who comes to me smelling a perfume, I say, no, nope. you know, I've got a French lady who had ovarian cancer. When I told her, no dairy, no perfumes, and no wine, because it might contain casein, she struggled and said, but I'm French. <laughs> but she's still alive 10 years later. Uh, plastics are dreadful, and my dentist keeps trying to stuff all sorts of Plastics in my mouth, and I keep sending them away, and I, I will only have gold or ceramics. Um, UV screens, PCBs, wonder chemical of the 70s, they're still around, and brominated flame retardants. I mean, I could go on, but just to give you some idea of, of what we've done. Ionizing radiation is very interesting. We hear a lot about the nuclear industry. Well, it provides so little radiation, I couldn't plot it on either of my pie diagrams. But what I want you to notice is how the USA gets almost three times the natural ion the ionizing radiation of the UK. Where's that coming from? 50% is coming from medical treatment and diagnostics. So one CT scan, you get a dose that's about, it can be 500 to 1,000 times that of a common chest X-ray. The other point to make is a lot of it can be natural radiation from radon gas. So if people live on granites or shales or certain limestones, they need to make sure their house is really well ventilated. And again, the USA is badly affected. In our country, good old um, uh, NHS means people don't keep going and buying all these CT scans, so it's less than 15%. Now, the effects of chronic stress, Janet and I did a lot of work on it, as I mentioned earlier, there's too much activity on the sympathetic nervous system. That's the one that fight or flight, and it's fine in the short term. In an acute situation, it is not good if you're affected chronically. This is George Monbiot in The Guardian. Academics in the media have failed dismally to ask the crucial question of scientists' claims. Who's paying you? Who's paying for your research? Well, I can say, quite honestly, nobody to do with cancer or food. I work for the mining industry making sure their environmental performance is up to speed. So it's okay for me, but so often you hear somebody on the BBC and you say, John Humphreys, why don't you ask this person? George Monbiot raised this because somebody was on going on about the nanny state, about smoking, and it turned out the man was funded by British American Tobacco, which is why George Monbiot wrote that. Now, this is... Um, a view from about breast cancer and environmental disease produced by, I think it was Unison and another charity. And it was very hard on the traditional cancer treatment. And I don't go with it completely, but I'm just showing you this is one view of the cancer industry. And I have to say, when you look at some of the sites from pharmaceuticals, they do talk about a burgeoning future market. They do see it as a market opportunity 
which is very worrying. Recently, um, Dr. Sam Epstein has written a book called The Politics of Cancer Revisited. And again, he's say, one of the reviews said, this is a superbly documented indictment of the NCI and ACS for their reckless indifference to cancer prevention, for their incestuous relationship with the cancer drug industry, and for their false claims for miracle drugs and for winning the war against cancer. Uh, I stress, I do think that pharmaceuticals and things have a role to play, but as we've heard from so many speakers, you need a much more holistic approach, diet, exercise, stress, all those things are very important. I've written various books, as I've said, I've got a new one coming out because people tend to say, well, she's just a, a scientist. Um, and this is the new book. I don't think anybody can um, you know, say Mustafa Jamgoz does not know what he's doing. He's the chair of the College of Medicine Science Committee and very famous for his work on cancer metastasis. Thank you all very much for listening. I won't drink any um, bottled water because um, I, I, I just don't think, especially not from plastic bottles. Um, I just drink tap water and I filter it through an activated charcoal filter. Then it'll be fine because the estrogens basically don't like being in water. They're called hydrophobic. But there are, there are far more estrogens in dairy than there are in water, I assure you. I think it's more important to filter but um, I think if you boil it and have green tea, I think Dr. Thomas mentioned this morning, you know, green tea is really powerful against cancer. And uh, interestingly, when I used to work in China, and the taxi driver would be drinking from something that looked to me as if it had caterpillars in the bottom, and it was actually green tea, and every time he went to a hotel, he'd go and ask for more hot water. It was just his green tea leaves. And, and in the end, he'd eat the green tea leaves. So they really were high on green tea. I buy it from oriental shops. One, I, I think the Brits are very good at blending black tea, but I can't stand British blended green tea. It's just bitter. So I go to a Korean shop in New Malden and buy my green tea there. My diet doesn't work at all with lung cancer. It works very well with... I've helped a lot of people with lymphoma, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, lots of cancers but it doesn't work hardly at all with lung cancer. It won't touch it. Often it's diagnosed so very late, and often the changes are so in the genes are so near the nucleus that diet doesn't really affect it, whereas with breast cancer and prostate cancer, the changes to genes are in the outer part of the relay. So change in intercellular fluid will have an influence. I'm afraid the economics of the dairy industry are such that they have to really push the cows. Um, I mean, the, the Chinese, a book, um, um, a book called Materia Medica, reputed to have been written by the Chinese mythical um, doctor 5,000 years ago. In it, he says, you must never eat food that starts its life as liquid from any animal's udder. And I had to remind several of my Chinese colleagues of that recently. And they started running around and saying, oh, Shen Nung, yes, we'd forgotten Shen Nung. But that's what he told them. <laughs> Well, the thing that worries me is that if people are put on clinical trials, they just get scanned and scanned and scanned and scanned. And as one lady I worked out, you know, if you take the average dose of, say, 2.4 millisieverts a year, which a UK citizen would get, I worked out she was going to get something like 500 years dose in six months, and I don't think that's sensible at all. I mean, I think MRI is much safer, of course. <clears throat> Great British invention. I think it's much safer. But with mine, I'm monitored by a brilliant clinical oncologist, and I, he's got so much experience, I'd rather trust him. I think we're talked out. Thank you all very much for listening. Thank you.